most Britons, most Europeans, they see the news, there's a terrorist attack here, there's mm. something happens in Paris, something happens in Brussels. Uh, but the, the political class and even most European citizens do not even look at it in big picture no. terms. It's strange in Europe these days, the way in which we get caught up on these, you know, something happens, something mm. blows up, mm. And then a few hours, you know, we go back to the usual routine. The next day, sort of, you know, within a week, you know, before the funerals are over, everyone's right. sort of moved on. Right. And um, I thought this needed to try to be explained. Um, yeah. And you do, you, uh, as you say, it's at a certain level, it's about us. Mm. Um, so that even though Islam mm. uh, makes it into the subtitle yeah. of your book, uh, it, it's it's not primarily about terrorism no. or even about Islam. Something mm. deeper is going on yeah. in Europe, of which yeah. uh, Islam and terrorism are really just symptoms. Yes, I mean it's something you've said for a long time that the that as it were, this just happens to be the opportunistic thing that's that, that's mm. most serious that's going on at the moment. Mm. But it sort of could have been anything in a way, mm. anything that was assertive and and, and believed mm. in itself. Um, I, I, I say in the book there are this sort of set of what I think of as thought diseases that we have, right. um, guilt being one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, existential tiredness, which I explained at one point, right. is another. Yeah. That sense that, you see, when trying to look at why politicians and others would totally change the society that they ought to be looking after, right? I, it can't only be accident. <laughs> no, no. And it's certainly not conspiracy because nobody could have arranged this so well. Right. And, um, and I thought it, it, it's in part this feeling that it, we run out, yeah. that, that the stories run out, that, uh, that, that, as I say at one point, a change is as good as a rest. Right, right. Um, Which is... And people do actually believe it. Oh, well, yeah. you just just to tell the story the way you tell it. You begin with a very uh, nuts and bolts chapter on right. immigration, and you make a the very basic point that yeah. all the most anti-immigrant figures in the 1960s, mm. what has happened is uh, on a scale beyond yeah. all their doomsday predictions. Yeah. So that for uh, British uh, viewers and other European viewers and Commonwealth viewers will be familiar with the name of Enoch Powell, who mm -hmm. was a prominent conservative and gave a famous speech which became known as the Rivers of Blood speech. And you point out in the beginning of your book that if you look at mm -hmm. the, the boroughs in London, which are now majority non-white British, mm -hmm. Uh, that's beyond anything Powell yeah. predicted. No, if uh, I say if Powell in 1968 yeah. Yeah. had decided to say that in 2011 the official census would yeah. show people who identified as white Britons to yeah. be in a minority in their yeah. capital city. Right. Yeah. I mean, that would have caused... Uh, I mean, we think that the speech yeah. caused enough trouble as it was. That yeah. really... I mean, that would have got him, you know, uh, confined, I'd have thought. But he, he would have, he, people would have thought that he was just nuts, that yes. there's no way that can happen yes. that quickly. Yes, and, uh, and uh, yeah, there was, as we all know, all the worst doomsayers yeah. uh, were underestimating the situation. I mean, the, the other one is, is uh, or one of the others I give is the example in France of this, I, I think, a ugly novel, The Camp of the Saints, yeah. which has, you know, a million people landing on the shores of, uh, of France right. coming from the third world. And there's this interview I quote in the book where in 2011 the author of that novel that was published in 1973 thought to be absolutely explosive and, uh, uh. and so on he's interviewed about the fact that quite a lot of what he said seems to have sort of happened and yeah. at the end of the interview in 2011 on French television uh, the interview says but you've got to admit Jean Respire you've got yeah. to admit I mean the numbers yeah. never yeah. happen like that and he says no that's true I mean we never actually had a million people come right. in one go yeah yeah you know, 2011, right? Was. Um, so, uh, so yeah, even the most apocalyptic people. I mean, um, yeah, yeah, and then and then Frau Merkel invites in whatever it is, a million yeah. and a half to yeah. Germany, and you have a, and again, these are the major powers we're talking about here: yeah. uh, Britain, France, Germany. But you just mentioned en passant at one point that the majority of Swedes alive now. Mm. will live long enough to see them become mm. 
a minority in their own country. Yeah. This is Sweden, which is kind of as far north as you can go yeah. in Europe. And it's also, I mean, it's interesting to me because with Britain, you know, the, uh, the 1948 British Nationality Act made a quarter of the world's population yeah. British subjects. Uh, they did not distinguish in law between one of His Majesty's subjects from Kingston-on-Thames, right. Kingston-Ontario, Kingston-Jamaica. You can argue about whether that's a good idea, mm. but it is uh, a legal fact. Mm. Sweden is not anybody's idea of a great no. global empire. How no. do Swedes wind up becoming a minority in that's their own right. country? It, it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting case of Swedish one. There, are, it, uh, there were things that I kept on thinking may not apply to certain countries. Mm. But I thought maybe, I mean, the Swedes have got no reason to have post-colonial guilt. No. Know? I mean, I mean yeah. there's a good argument for Britain having it for a bit, you yeah, know, but, yeah. but the Swedes. Yeah. And, then you, and, and also then, then the other bits of the guilt, of course, which I think is one of the fundamental things in, in, in Europe that we're, we're going to have to shake off, but may not. Um, you know, the Swedes don't seem like, they're not like the Germans, you know, who have like a good cause to have recent guilt complexes yeah. and so on and forever, you know, needing to apologise for what they think and feel and do. Uh, uh, the Swedes, you know, you wouldn't expect that. Actually, all of the same things exist. I mean, the Swedes do have a kind of weird post-colonial thing. They have a guilt thing yeah. as well. They've Actually, strangely, the further away they come from the war, the more guilty they feel about it, it seems. Right. So... It's just more quietly expressed, but they're all, they're all symptoms of the same thing. It's just ever so slightly different inflections in each country. Sometimes one country's facts are different, but the response is exactly the same. Yeah, there's an interesting phenomenon uh, that goes on in, in Europe. When, when I first started writing about this, I guess, you know, shortly after 9-11, mm. sophisticated people that think tanks and whatnot used to say, well, the, this is a completely banal reductio. Obviously, if right. you look at uh, Pakistanis in Yorkshire, mm. uh, that's completely different from the experience of yeah. uh, Algerians in Clichy-sous-Bois yes. or Turks yes. in uh, Hamburg. or uh, and, and in fact, none of it is. It's yes. like you could toss, you know, the Turks yes. could be in Yorkshire and the Pakistanis uh, yes. could be in Clichy Subwa and it all seems to come out the same. Yes, I mean, well, that's one of the things that you've been on to for longer than anyone. Um, at any, you know, think tank, I mean, any public meeting, any political discussion, yeah. any television show, yeah, yeah. most of the time, yeah. you know, this one aside and a yeah. few others, but I mean, any, like, I know, BBC show, like, you, you never get into the only thing that matters. Yeah. It, it, it's, um, you, you never get on to the important things. It's, it's just time to sort of say, well, you know, there's a huge difference, isn't there, Douglas, between these people and that people. Right. And, you go, and you go, well, yeah, I mean, and then, well, thank you, and that's, that's that. Right, right, <laughs> you right, don't right, get right. the chance to, yeah. to say, what about, what about this huge thing that's happening? And, um, and I think there are all sorts of reasons for that. One is that, it, that we console ourselves through this period by pretending it's not going on. But as I say at one point in the book, you know, the presumption we've had is that if you the lie of more than a generation mm. is, is if you walk into uh, the Italian islands or the Greek islands yeah. or anywhere else, you walk up through Europe, you become as European as anyone else and you, yeah. you breathe the air of uh, Voltaire and St. Yeah. Paul and yeah. Dante and Goethe and yeah. Bach and Right. And that's nonsense. I think it's highly unlikely that everyone who arrives in Europe arrives at the same slightly pained, wounded and tired view that modern Europeans find themselves to be. I think it's highly unlikely they'll have just arrived and happened to be at the stage we're in our views of religion, for instance. No. You describe at one point uh, you're in France mm. and you visit the famous uh, cathedral yeah. in which uh, Charles Martel's mm -hmm. remains are interred, the man who uh, held the line against Islam in 732 and is uh, celebrated, and that's why he's buried among yeah. the French kings. That's his mm -hmm. uh, stature. And yet you, sub you describe the scene around that yes. cathedral, which is really quite remarkable. Yes. Uh, aside from that... Christian building in the middle of it, it's not Europe anymore. No, I mean, I say if Charles Martel got out of his tomb, mm. 
mm. and uh, yeah. wandered just outside the Basilica of Saint Denis, mm. he would mm. think he, he lost the Battle of right. Tours. Right. Um, it's a very strange and painful thing, this. Uh, the French, I think, are deeply pained by this. They don't know what to do about it. Uh, the, the, the centre of Paris, they all know this place is there. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. extraordinarily part of their history where the tombs of the kings all are. Yeah. But they, uh, they don't want to go there. And they wish it wasn't there. Well, they wish it wasn't as it was. But it is. 